Well, how's it going? I'm Mark Duffy. Welcome to my channel. On today's episode, we're talking all things exporting and what settings you should be using for either exporting to Instagram or for print. And I know what you're thinking. Oh my God, export settings. I am so absolutely excited to know export settings. But it is a common question I get all the time. How do I stop Instagram and Facebook from over compressing my photos? The compression has made my photos look so bad. What do you do? Uh, someone has asked me to print a photo and I have no idea what to do. So let's get into this and let's see what settings do you need to know for Lightroom? What settings do you need to know for Photoshop? And then what's the difference between when you're exporting for web and when you're exporting for print? Okay, the first thing we need to address is the differences between when you're exporting for web and when you're exporting for print, so the two very, very different animals, we'll call it that. So let's talk about web. What do you need to do when you're when you're exporting for web? So it doesn't matter if you're saying to me that you know it's going on to someone's phone. Once it goes on to anything that's a screen, that's screen based, your color profile is going to be sRGB, and the resolution that is only required is 72 dpi. Now this is one of the things I always get as a question when people email me when it comes to setting resolutions is. They, they want to give more than what's needed. When you're saving for web, it doesn't matter if it's gonna go on someone's TV, if it's gonna go on to Facebook, or if you just wanna see it on your phone. You do not need 300 DPI, you don't, you don't need 150 DPI. 72 is the max that you need. And this is where I think a lot of people are falling into issues where they're getting over compressed. If you give a file to Facebook at 300 DPI, the file size is gonna be quite big and their system is gonna get that photo and just truncate it down and optimize it to suit their needs. And if they don't care how it looks and that's where you get the over compression. That's where I feel anyway, is you have over exceeded the threshold for both the depth of the photo and the size of the file size. And they're gonna scale that down and that's where you get over compression issues. So stick to the 72 DPI and leave stuff like 150 DPI and 300 DPI for print only so then after that you just have to decide what size does the image need to be on web and we'll just go through that now okay so what I'm going to show you right now is how to crop your images when they're portrait for Instagram so go up to the crop section and then where it says original go down to four to five now this is going to get rid of some of your image so you're going to have to find the best compromise where you show enough of the image and it still has a good composition so about there is about right so just hit enter when you're ready and then when I go and I just right click and go down to the export sections and let's export this for Instagram. And then first thing I do is go into custom name and I change the name of the file. Uh, you can set already the folder you want. I'm happy with the folder it's going to. Make sure to use dashes in between the words as when you use it in Google, it helps with the SEO. So then when you come down to the file size and now this has already been set from a previous image, usually that's set at 300 DPI. So we're gonna set that back to 72 dpi and then you go to resize to fit and i usually just use the long edge but you can use different sections there i only ever use the long edge and what i find is optimum is 1920 pixel on the long side hit export and that's it done so now i'm going to show you what you would do if you were working for a client and you have a batch of photos that you you don't need to edit in photoshop so you're just happy to export out of lightroom so here's a selection of photos that i did for rock salt on dock so i'm just going to go through a few here that i'm happy with so you just select the last one go back to the start shift select and then right click and go down to your export settings and all these will apply to them the difference i do here is in the custom name i go for custom name sequence and that will add a number to the end of your file name and you just need to change the file name accordingly and in this case here i actually don't want to change the size of the image and i want to leave it at 300 dpi for them so that gives them a full range because they can change this to cmyk if they need to go for printing at a later stage so we just change and I'm going to go to a different foldering. So this is how I'd folder. So create a new folder. I'm going to call it Rock Salt Dundalk. So then just select that folder. Yeah, that's it. And then go down to the custom name. I'm going to call that Rock Salt Dundalk as well. And you'll see at the end of the name, it has a dash one. Each image will then get a corresponding number thereafter. I don't usually change the metadata or anything out there. I don't really touch any of that. You can if you want, totally up to you. Um, I don't usually, and I don't want watermark either. So export if you're happy with your settings. And you'll see in the top left, it'll say export 18 files in this case. And we'll just speed it up because it does take a little while, especially when you're exporting 300 DPI. 
Now what I'm going to show you is what I actually normally do. So if I'm happy with an edit of an image, but I want to continue the edit in Photoshop, or if I want to watermark, because I prefer to watermark through Photoshop, let's show you how I do that right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click on the image and we're going to go down to edit in and edit in Photoshop. And I actually already have Photoshop loaded, so it will load the photo quite quickly. So then what we first need to do is we need to resize the image. So Control Alt I, select pixels, change it to 72 dpi, and then 1920 on the long side. Again, it's constraining the size, so we don't have to worry about the width. So Control Zero to full screen it. We're gonna open a file now with my watermark where it's already been designed and the layout has been decided upon. You can see I've already set it that it's gonna be for 1920. So pre-organize this and it's already for my photography, my design and my drums. And today we're just gonna be using my photography one. So we're just gonna drag it up. Let's bring that in, hit OK. And I, you can place it wherever you want. I place it in the bottom left corner. I have my own ways of the position that I want it. It's in the exact same position every time because I haven't memorized where it needs to be. Control Alt Shift S for save for web and the dialogue will pop up. And in the bottom left, you'll see the size of the image. Now two megabytes is a little bit big, but you can go through this preview and you can see the quality as you bring it down uh, for what it is. So if you bring it down to say 80%, now the size of the image is under a meg. Now that could be good enough quality. Have a look around, it's probably good enough quality, but I wouldn't like it that much. So bring it back up to 95 because I like to keep it around 1.5 megabytes. Hit save when you're ready and then folder it and name it as you wish. So go back into Lightroom, I want to show you what I would do now if the image was reset to a 2 to 3 ratio on a portrait. How would I actually crop it when I'm in Photoshop? So right click it, edit in Photoshop, and let's see how I would edit this photo. So I'm just going to show you here, I might have been doing some dodging and boring, just going to be really quick. And once we're finished and happy with that, we will then um, flatten the image. You can just do Control E, and then normally what I would tell you to do is Control Alt I. And that's going to resize the image, and you see the width is at 1280. We don't want that. Instead, we're going to use the Crop Tool C. Press that. Go up to the ratio, and we want four to five. And there you have same as uh, Lightroom, but you want to hold the Shift button while you're dragging to make sure it goes in a straight line. And set it to when you want. Hit Enter, and that's it. Now you can resize it down, 72 DPI, 1920, and then we have that 1536 on the width. And then we can apply our logo as before. If it was in your previous, go up to your Open Recent. Just drag the layer, make sure it's active. Drag it in, place it in, hit OK. And that's it, it's, re it's really simple. That's the process I do, and more than likely, that's how I do most of my photos. If they don't need extra editing in Photoshop, that's the process that I do. Okay, now we're in print, and this is a total different animal to web. There's a lot more options that you have to consider, and communication with your print lab, if you're going to a print lab, is absolutely crucial. The first thing you should be talking about when you go to a print lab is what color profile should you be working in, and what size resolution should be, you'll be working with. And I don't mean pixels. I don't mean 4,000 by 5,000 pixels. We're not looking at that at the minute. We actually don't really care for the pixels because it's more about the actual physical size in inches and centimeters and millimeters. That's what you're really going to be told the size is. So pixels don't really come into it anymore. It's more inches and DPI, whether you need 300 DPI, 240 DPI or 150 DPI. And it all depends on the application that you need it for. 150 DPI is usually reserved for printing and banners. So absolute massive files. So in that case, you're probably not going to be talking about millimeters. And if you are, into thousands. Uh, you could be talking a couple of meters, two meters, three meters, five meters, ten meters, that kind of that kind of size. And the reason, two of the reasons they use a smaller DPI is one, the person who's going to be looking, the viewer who's going to be looking at these is going to be standing a good bit away. So they don't need 300 DPI. And as well as that, it reduces the file size. So it means it, it makes it easier for everyone involved. Your processing on the computer gets easy, their processing of the image gets easy, and it, it's just, it's an easier way of working. So. so once you have your resolution, now you have to worry about what color profile you want. And for things like books, like my book, um, CMYK is what's required for something like this here. 
Um, you can get instances where you won't be using CMYK, you could be using sRGB. I usually find when printers are using sRGB, that's more of a consumer range, that's not the professional range. CMYK is the industry standard, so expect most times when you go to a printer, you're going to be using CMYK. Unless you're doing fine art and you're doing photography printing, then you're going to be looking at Photo Pro RGB. So with CMYK, the printers that they're using usually only have four cartridges. C for cyan, M for magenta, Y for yellow, and K for black. And that's what they're, that's what they're going to get. Your full spectrum of color is going to be got from them four colors. Now take, for instance, when you go to a higher grade uh, printer for fine art photography or just any kind of photography at all, really. Um, and it's the kind of stuff that gets printed when I go to Framtastic.net. They have printers that have up to 12 cartridges of color so they can really get color accurate prints okay so now we're going to show you how i would approach when i'm preparing my files for print so you see all the edits i've done on the right hand side we need to just flatten all them because i could be resizing and stuff and we just want them all to be consolidated into one the next thing i do is i go into the curves adjustment and i'm going to raise it up just a little bit just enough to brighten it so that my edit is right when it prints. And usually how I look at it is the white line is in the middle of each square. So you see it's in the middle of the horizontal and it's in the middle approximately on the vertical. Just memorize that shape and I find that's enough brightness that when you print it, it will look the way it looked on your screen. So when you finish with that, you need to flatten that because we're going to resize it now as well. And we don't want any, any jigging around happening. So control out I, change it to inches and we're gonna change this to 36. So a three foot by two foot print. Normally I would tell you never to do this, but these size files, they're actually, it's actually okay. It's its manageable. At number five foot, you probably get your print lab to do it. And if you have a look here, if we zoom in, we're at 16% now, zoom into 100%. You can see it's still really good quality. There's, not, there's, there's no real blurring. And I've printed loads of files like this at three foot by two foot. Uh, again, like I say, at a, a five foot size, I probably would get my print lab to look after this. So we go Control Shift S, select JPEG, name the file as such, and I usually put in the size so there's no confusion as to what you've sent to print lab. And you'll see by default, the color space is Photo Pro RGB from um, your fine art printing. For CMYK, we'll go up to Image, then to Mode, and you can change it to 8 bits, not necessary, and then you can change it just to CMYK. All the layers are flattened, and that's it. Really simple. Again, Control Shift S, select JPEG, and you'll see that the CMYK is selected and we'll name it CMYK so there's no confusion once again. And you see here I'm in InDesign right now and this is my book that I released. And all of these images are actually saved as JPEGs in CMYK. There's one error down the bottom here and that's because there's a link broken. If there was any images here that weren't CMYK, they would also appear that we would need to change the color space to suit the book. I just wanted to show you this really quickly that in another like a publisher file like this here, it is important to have the right color space. Now I want to talk about how to get the seamless corners needed in a canvas print and it's quite easy to do. So we're going to work on the actual file of the fan and head lighthouse and the first thing we need to do is go to the layer panel and actually double click the layer to make it inactive as a background layer. Next we're going to use Control alt c to change the canvas size. So this is going to produce a transparent canvas around it. So we'll change it to inches, add 4, so 40 for the width and now 28. That's 2 inches either side for the overlap of your corners. And as you'll see now, the blank space is going to be where the seamless corners comes in. So the next trick now is just to duplicate the layer. So Control J, we're going to go up to Edit, then to Transform, and then flip the uh, vertical. Drag it to the top, and then double check that you make sure that you are right to the edge of the other one. Make sure it's absolutely seamless and there's no transparent pixels. Zoom in as much as you need, make sure that is absolutely perfect. And I'm just going to speed this up now because it's just repetitive afterwards. So just a case of just duplicate the original layer and flip it for whatever side that you need to. Just making sure that you don't have any transparent lines, so there's no white lines coming on your print. In this case here, I actually duplicate the flipped horizon so I don't have to do it a second time. Just makes it quicker. So just get it on the left hand side, double check it, move it over to the right hand side and double check it once again. Once we're done now, we need to address the corners. So we're going to click L for the lasso polygonal tool and then we're gonna draw a little bit outside the edge and we're gonna use Fill Content Aware and we're gonna use Shift F5 for, for the fill. Select Content Aware, Photoshop does the rest. It usually does a good job, but in this case it didn't, so we're gonna to have to use the Clone Stamp tool. So hit S for the Clone Stamp. So select S for the Clone Stamp and just paint in this section just a little bit. You don't have to go too mad, because don't forget, this is right in the corner, so it's, not, it's really not going to be seen, but I wouldn't mind it just being a little bit 
you just never know. And we just do the same over for each corner now. I'm just gonna speed this up again so you can see, not really taking too much care to what I'm doing and just trying to fill in as best I can. And that's your file ready for a canvas print. So just Control Shift S, save for JPEG, and then call it three foot by two foot canvas. And for those wondering about what calibrator I use, I use the i1 Display Pro by X-Rite. It's a great little unit. I have it probably about over three, four years now at this stage, and it's still working perfectly. I keep it actually in its box as it came to make sure it doesn't get damaged because it is one of these things that you only have to buy it once and you'll have it for a long, long time. And it's great, it's easy to use. I will do a separate video for this because I think it, it is something I need to address separately. And yeah, I do them, I wouldn't even do it all that often, maybe one a month, maybe once every two months. It takes about seven minutes to calibrate the screen and yeah, it's great, love it, color accurate. You know, the contrast is accurate for printing, not really for online or web and that there, but that's because of the smartphones. Smartphones and that have extra contrast to appeal to consumers, and that's one issue that I do have with viewing my, my stuff online. My photos do look a lot more contrasted than intended, but when I print them, they look fine. So there you go, there are the settings that I use when I'm exporting my photos, whether it's for online or for print. And I do hope you got something from that, and it, maybe that has cleared up some questions you've had in the past, whether it's, you know, you want to print your photos and you don't know how to, or that you just found that the social media side of things has been over compressing your photos. And if you did get something from this, should give the video a little like. Maybe subscribe to my channel if you're enjoying what I'm doing. And if you do have maybe a suggestion for another technique that you know of that I didn't cover, let me know in the comments because I'm always interested in learning new techniques because that's the great thing about Adobe and especially with Photoshop, there's a million different ways to do the one thing. And I always love learning different approaches because maybe one approach is quicker than the other, maybe another approach is better than another. So I'm not saying these are the best approaches, these are just what I've been doing over the last number of years. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram and if you wanna have a look at my website, you can check it out. All the links will be down in the description below. And until the next time, later Gators.